Good afternoon. On behalf of our team at RDIEC, we'd like to welcome Audrey and Andrew. They're here this afternoon to discuss the type of work pilots do, the training they receive, the characteristics they're looking for in a candidate, the career opportunities, salary expectations, and the working conditions. Just a reminder before we begin that after you watch this presentation, please complete the survey found on our website, either by using the QR code or go to our website at rdiec.ca. By completing the survey, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift certificate, which will be drawn at the end of every month. As well, please hit our subscribe button on the YouTube channel to get further updates. So without further ado, welcome Andrew and Audrey. Thank you very much. Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Regina Flying Club uh, via Zoom today. Uh, we're happy to have anyone here that, you know, that wants to be able to ask questions about becoming a pilot. Uh, Andrew and myself, Audrey, we're going to kind of give you the rundown a little bit about ourselves and also obviously explain what it takes to become a pilot. Um, if there's anyone on right now, which I don't believe I, we have any other participants right now, um, We'd certainly welcome you to tell us your name and what's gotten you interested into aviation. And I think we'll just continue. So a little bit of my background. Um, when I was a, a young kid, my, my dad's brothers, my uncles uh, had airplanes and one was a crop duster and one had a Cessna 172. So my grandparents had a grass runway on their farm and obviously by going for an airplane ride, I fell in love with airplanes. And that's the rest of my story. So in order to, uh, to uh, get my pilot's license, I realized in my hometown, I joined a program uh, with the Air Cadets because it enabled me to get my gliding license and my private license um, via scholarship versus having to pay for my licenses. So when I was uh, 15 and 16, through the Air Cadets, I got my gliding license and then my private pilot's license. After that, I, uh, after graduation, I commenced, I uh, moved to Saskatoon. I'm sure everyone being that we're all from Saskatchewan here is familiar with Saskatoon. I went there and I ended up working as a flight attendant. And that kind of got me into the door, the back door literally to see what goes on in aviation. And then after that, I, I went to Grant McEwen College in Edmonton and I did the aviation management program. And my first job after that program, I became a flight instructor in Edmonton. And then after a couple of years of instructing, as I built some time, some pilot and command time, I got into corporate aviation. And within the corporate aviation, I was able to fly a PC-12, a King Air 200, a Phenom 100, which is the picture that I have up. Uh, which is a small business jet and then of course what we're experiencing right now uh, after my first uh, flying job in 2008 we had a downturn in the economy so what happened is i got laid off and i ended up in the helicopter industry and within that organization i was able to be a safety manager and then i became an assistant ops manager and then uh, i went back to flying because of course everything you'll notice uh, as you continue on with life that lots of things are cyclical in aviation. Well, that downturn in the economy, we eventually turned around, came back and got back into flying. So I got back into flying and then a few years ago, I, uh, my mother got sick. So I returned back to the homeland of Saskatchewan and the uh, only aviation a job available in Regina was to become the general manager of the Regina Flying Club. So here I am today, that's a little bit of my background. And if Andrew wants to give us a little blurb of him. Yeah, so there's actually quite a bit of similarities between myself and Audrey. Uh, we actually, for a brief time, worked at the same company, just not at the same time. Uh, she was a little bit uh, before me. So um, I got into the industry, well, I started my, uh, my flight training back in August of 2001. Uh, so a month later, 9-11 happened. So not the best timing for my start. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you guys straight away that when it gets into aviation, one of the biggest factors on whether you will be a success or not uh, is really beyond your control. It really has to do with the larger economy. And uh, if you start at a good time when there's lots of jobs, then you'll, you'll find a job fairly easy. 
if you start at a time in the industry when there's a downturn in the economy or you know people are afraid to fly for whatever reason whether it's terrorism or covid um that's going to greatly affect your ability to have a well, it, it doesn't affect your ability to have a career. It just makes it more challenging. And I think that's kind of a good thing because it gives you more stories to tell later on. So I, I, I started my flight training back in 2001. I saw the writing on the wall at that point. I was only about 16, 17 years old. I said, well, maybe, uh, maybe a flying job isn't for me. So I decided to go to university for a little bit. I did that for a couple of years and I decided, no, my heart's still in aviation. I got to go back and try this. So um, when you start off in aviation, there's basically one of two ways that you can, you can go about it. You can get student loans and you can burden yourself with those things. If you got someone that can co-sign it, that makes things a little bit easier for you, but then you're, you're pretty much weighed down for a good eight, 10 years after that while you're paying it off. Uh, I chose a different road. I basically paid as I went. So it meant that I had to spend the next five years, uh, scrubbing toilets and, uh, cleaning fish guts out of fish nets and doing whatever random job I could find in order to uh, pay my way through flight training. And it took me five years. So, I mean, this is not something, this is a long-term investment, right? And they say the, the greatest investment you can make is in yourself, in your own skills and abilities. Uh, anyway, so I did my, um, I saved up enough cash and where my ha family happened to be at the time when I was uh, beginning my flight training was in Regina. So I did uh, my, my private pilot license here at the Regina Flying Club. And uh, the hardest part of, really getting into aviation is the first step you know the whole the old looney tunes quote the first step is a woo woo you know getting yourself uh beginning it can seem very daunting because you're getting into a field that you really know very little about and the question is where do you start uh the best advice i can give is just go to the flying club i mean um for i remember that i i vividly remember the first time walking in the flying club there because it's it's a it's a hangar it's an old world war ii hangar near the airport uh, terminal and uh, walking in, you basically, there's no um, reception desk right at the beginning. You basically walk into the hangar where all the planes are. And at first you feel like you're trespassing because you feel like you shouldn't be there near all these expensive planes, but you just have to push your way to the back and that's where the reception desk is. And you go in there and I just remember there was an instructor behind the desk there and I said, hi, you know, my name's Andrew. Can, can you teach me how to fly? And it happened to be uh, Mike Meehan, one of our instructors who's still there now. And he became my, my primary flight instructor for a couple of years. Um, and that's where it all started. Now, the great thing about aviation, especially the Regina Flying Club, we have instructors with a great uh, wealth of experience. The guys have been doing this job for some of them 20 or 30 years, and they're really good at what they do. Uh, myself, I've been instructing here for about the last six months or so, but I have a pretty diverse background. We'll get into that shortly. But when it comes to um, aviation, we'll show you the way, but you still need to do the work. And it is a lot of work. This is one of those uh, industries that doesn't suffer fools. Uh, because if you're, if you're not professional and strictly safety adherent, uh, you could potentially hurt yourself. So safety has got to be number one at all times. In any case, back to my kind of backstory here. So I did uh, my, my private pilot license here at the Regina Fly Club, which gives me the ability to fly leisurely in my own time and my own discretion. Um, now, however, I want to make money doing this too. So I had to go for a further, uh, further license, which is called my commercial pilot license, which gives me the ability to make money doing this. And that's definitely one of the big goals. Now, uh, I was actually um, quite fortunate. I had a great instructor that gave me a lot of uh, really good advice so that when I did my flight tests, I actually scored quite high. Uh, high enough, actually, that I was given an award that year for the, called the President's Trophy Award, which basically distinguished myself by having the highest flight test score that year. Um, it, was, it did quite well. And fortunately, with those results, I was able to take that to a, um, a Canada-wide flying competition called the Webster Trophy Competition. And it basically gave me the opportunity to represent Saskatchewan in a flying competition exclusively for amateur pilots. So we're talking guys who, who have maybe a little bit of flying experience but haven't started their first job yet. And... Um, the that year the flying competition was being held out in uh, Moncton at the Moncton Flight College so I had already achieved my my private pilot license my commercial pilot license and uh, as part of this competition I went out to Moncton I was quite impressed by the school there it was a very nice uh, place had some great facilities so I decided eventually to um, to finish up the remainder of my training and basically that entails getting something called a multi IFR rating which is the, the long and short uh, way of describing that is saying I have the ability to fly twin engines and to uh, fly in the clouds because you, you don't actually fly in the clouds for the beginning large significant part of your training because uh, it can be disorienting the first time you do it and we want to teach you the basics before we kind of push you into the uh, the deep end of the pool so to speak so I finished up all my training at the Moncton Flight College I was uh, successful they were and this is why I say it comes back to where's the industry at the time and by the time I finished all my ratings this was in 2008 when I got my first job into flying and when it comes to getting your first job in flying, you know, most people, what they literally have to do, and this is no exaggeration, you pack up your car and you drive coast to coast 
and you stop at every major airport along the way. And you basically go to every company you can find, you hand them your resume and you say, hi, my name is, you introduce yourself. And if someone's hiring, maybe you've made that, that personal connection that can get you started in the industry. And I can pretty much guarantee you, it's not going to be a flying job to start. It's like, oh yeah, we, we need someone in the hangar that needs to like load boxes and put stuff in the plane and maybe clean the planes. Like you're going to be the gopher, the, the, the guy that's going to have to do all the grunt work. Uh, and that's how you start in the industry. You got to pay your dues. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a lot of work and it's going to be a long time before your investment pays dividends. Anyways, I was lucky that, you know, in 2008, there was the global financial crisis, a huge recession. So a lot of the airlines and industries in Canada weren't hiring at that time. Fortunately for me, uh, the Moncton Flight College, where I was doing my training, they had a contract with the Chinese airlines. And what they were doing is they would hire, uh, or they would train Chinese pilots from China. They bring them over here, get them all the flight training, and then send them back to China where they fly for the airlines. And uh, in that situation, I was able to uh, basically become an instructor for the school because they were so overwhelmed with demand because there was the, the great financial crisis, which basically knocked out North America, Europe, and some other countries. But in China, things were booming at the time. So I was very lucky to have a job right off the bat. Uh, I was a flight instructor for about three years, eventually teaching on the twin. Um, after that, I became a... Um, uh, a pilot for a company called Thunder Airlines, which is in Northern Ontario. It flies similar aircraft to what Audrey did with uh, King Airs, which is a twin turboprop. And uh, it was quite a fun job. It sent me up to places up in Northern Ontario, like uh, on the Hudson Bay coast and the James Bay coast. And you fly to these rural little strips in the middle of nowhere that are just dirt runways with towns of like only a thousand people in them. And you get to see a, a side of the world that you'd never have an opp opportunity to see otherwise. I did that for a few years, eventually being promoted to captain for a little while. And then uh, I had enough of the north and these brutally cold winters up there where it's minus 50. So I decided I need to get out. Uh, I was picked up by a company called Air Sprint. And the reason why I got that job was because I applied to them every day for six months. And eventually they gave me an opportunity. So you got to show dedication when it comes to this industry. You really have to distinguish yourself from the next guy over. And the big thing I can tell you guys is that you'll never find a help wanted sign in aviation. No one's ever going to put out that, that sandwich board that says, hey, we're looking for help. But there are jobs out there. So what you need to do when you're trying to get into this industry, you need to remember that you don't have to be the best. You just have to be better than everybody else. Right. So that's that's the way that you got to look at this. And uh, it is going to be very competitive. And the guy who wants the job the most is going to get it. Uh, now, that's not to say that the best person for the job is going to get it. Sometimes it means that it's the, the social networking, so the connections that you make along the way that are I mean, the, the guys that you might be doing training with and you go you, know, you don't think much of this guy over here when he's 17, but you know, in 10 years, he's suddenly chief pilot of a company going, holy smokes. I mean, it's good to keep up those connections because you never know where people are going to go in their career. But it also, what I would say is that even if you are deciding to get a career in aviation, you know, supplement your skill set by having something else that you can bring to the table. And sometimes it doesn't just mean flying, but maybe having some kind of uh, engineering knowledge or even just a really good work ethic and a good attitude, I think is the, the best things I can say. So anyways, I flew corporate jets out of Calgary for three years. Uh, it was a lot of fun because it got me out of the north. And I ended up flying to places like uh, all the, the VIP destinations like um, you know, California, Florida, the Caribbean, Mexico. You're taking these guys to their, their private villas off uh, on some random island somewhere. So it was, it was a great opportunity to see some really cool things. Um, I was capping on that for about a year and a half on the little uh, Citation jet. Uh, after that, I, I was getting in my early 30s at that point. I said, well, I got to make a decision here. Do I want to fly corporate for the rest of my life or do I want to get in the airlines? And I said, well, airlines is where it's at for both money and lifestyle. I think that's where I want to go. It's not nearly as fun, but uh, it's for long-term planning. It's the, the better choice for me. Anyways, I went over there for, uh, I flew for a company called Air, Sp or, sorry, called, um, Air Canada Express, uh, which is the regional airline for uh, Air Canada. I flew the regional jet there for three years and I eventually got hired by Air Canada uh, February 17th of 2020, which I'm coming up to my one year anniversary at this time. Uh, and uh, as luck would have it, COVID happened and it knocked everyone on their butts. And I was the first casualty of that. Within uh, the first two weeks, the writing was on the wall that I wasn't going to be there for much longer. So they laid me off. And uh, I was sitting around Regina for a little bit where my family was still at. And I said, well, you know, I want to stay busy. I still have a passion for flying. What can I do? And I called up the flying club and said, hey, do you guys need some help? And as it turned out, they were doing uh, gangbusters with students. So uh, here I am now. So I'm an instructor here at the Regina Flying Club and uh, having as much fun as ever. I'll leave it there. I'll give it back to you, Audrey. Is super happy to have Andrew. So here we are. We're going to quickly take you on a little journey here of becoming a pilot. Uh, where do you start? Well, as Andrew mentioned, show up at the flying club, ask them questions. But uh, keep in mind, you're going to have to uh, save lots of money. Um, something else that you might want to do is try a discovery flight, because this allows you to go up for uh, 
you know, a, a flight with an instructor, uh, it's a quick one. It'll be a half an hour, uh, 20 minutes is approximately the flight time. And then that way you'll be able to sit with the instructor, put your hands at the controls and decide, you know, is this something that you really enjoy? Uh, of course, find a school, flying school to enroll, enroll at, because uh, I know some of you are from rural schools too. So uh, you'd probably want to find something that's local to make the commute easier. Um, then after that, once you're serious about it, we look, we ask, you know, or what you would have to do is book a medical. So of course, there ha they have to be an aviation approved doctor. Uh, there's two in Regina, there's one in Moose Jaw. And then of course, uh, once you're enrolled at ground school, you're going to start flying. And actually, I'll, I'll just make a small addition there with regards to the medical. Yeah. A lot of people think that you need to be medically perfect to start flying, and that's not the case at all. Um, the only things I think that would fully prohibit you from uh, flying as a career would be if you're diabetic, um, which you can't fly single pilot. If you're in a two crew environment, you can, but making a step from single pilot to two crew without any experience is almost, uh, it's very, very difficult. Uh, the other thing is colorblindness. So you need to make sure that you aren't colorblind. Otherwise that could be a hindrance. Now that's not to say you need to be medically perfect. Otherwise, like I've known guys that are fully deaf in one ear. I'm actually quite deaf in my one ear on this side. Uh, guys that are monocular, meaning they only have one eye. There's guys with glass eyes out there that are flying around. Uh, heart murmurs, as long as it's not a major concern, then you're okay. So you'd be surprised as long as you might have to have some extra conditions. Like if you have to fly with glasses, that might be a condition, but yeah, don't, don't think that just because you're not in a peak physical form that you, you can't be a pilot. Absolutely. Good points. Um, here's just a little rundown of a private license requirement. So this is the first license that you would work towards. And of course, the minimum age to start actually flying and be able to go for solo flight to get your student pilot permit is age 14. And then uh, you can start your flight training at that age. But of course, to get your private license, you have to be uh, 17 years of age. And then of course you need a valid category one or three medical certificate like we just mentioned through a certified uh, Transport Canada uh, medical doctor. And then with the ground school, you're gonna complete a 45 hour ground school uh, curriculum. And then of course, after that, you'll have to do a written exam uh, through Transport Canada approved exam. And your flight training is gonna entail at a minimum 25 hours dual flight training and then 20 hours solo flight training. And of course, after all that, you'll go for a flight test and included in that is you'll have some instrument and navigation training within there. So that gives you the ability to go flying. Like if you wanna do cross country to visit family in Yorkton or Saskatoon, that's the privileges that that license gives you. Absolutely. So this is kind of like a rundown of a minimum cost for your private license here at the Regina Flying Club. And this is based on using our our smallest aircraft, the Cessna 150. So you're looking at about uh, just over $10,000. Then of course, after your private license, of course, uh, you only are able to fly during the day. So what you wanna do after that, so that you're not limited, is get a night rating. So then here is the uh, minimum cost for doing your night rating. So we'll have a grand tally at the end, so you'll have an idea of what everything costs. And then of course, after your night rating, you can start working towards your commercial license. So this is where, as Andrew mentioned before, in order to get paid to fly in aviation, you have to have a commercial license. And so for your commercial license, you have to be 18 years of age. And of course, you'll need a category one medical. And then uh, you'll pass, go basically the same rigmarole as a private license of doing minimal, uh, the minimal flight training, dual and solo. Of course, doing a written exam and, uh, passing the flight test, which here you go, this lists it all there again. And then the cost of the license, commercial license, you're looking at again, just uh, over $13,000. And as Andrew mentioned before, after he did his commercial, the next thing that comes along is doing a multi-rating. So basically now you get to fly with a plane with two engines and work on getting your instrument rating. So that like Andrew mentioned again, you get to fly in the cloud, so that's super exciting. And if you so choose after doing um, your multi and IFR, so your instrument rating, uh, a lot of people now like to do an instructor rating. Um, the way we are in this little bit of a lull with COVID uh, and the way the industry of what you see in the news right now with, with the layoffs in the airlines, um, people are still wanting to learn how to fly because like I mentioned uh, earlier, um, 
there is going there is a pilot shortage so uh, eventually when COVID is over we're going to have to influx the industry with more pilots so in the meantime uh, doing an instructor rating and building up some pilot and command time uh, in instructing at a local flying school uh, this will enable you to build some time so the average ballpark you're looking at spending probably anywhere from 47 to 55 thousand dollars to get all your license and ratings completed and of course it depends on the aircraft you use and how frequent you fly because uh, and that's why i suggested earlier that if you save a lot of money because if you end up paying as you go and if you just have a part-time job it's going to be hard to save the money because as you've seen the uh, the cost is rather expensive so if you save up a whole bunch of money and are able to condense the, and, and make your own schedule to fly frequently you're going to pay, end up spending less money on on reviewing stuff and then you're able to keep all your training consistent so you can finish in a shorter period of time so then you finish all your licenses then what are you going to do so something or some jobs in aviation that you can start out could be flight instruction, uh, you could become a charter pilot, um, as Andrew and I did, we did corporate or private flying for, for companies. Uh, you can work at an air ambulance, you can become a crop duster, you can do some aerial surveillance, surveillance. Uh, go to the airlines, you can do some cargo flying, firefighting, uh, traffic reporting in large cities for the radios and uh, TV, they'll, do, they'll have those kind of jobs. Uh, you can end up doing anything with the law enforcement or the military but of course if you go the military route you'll have a different uh, um, course of action of getting your licenses what does it take to become a pilot well you need to be someone who adapts to change because um, i'm sure andrew can attest that a day in the life of uh, especially a corporate pilot your day can change um, your client can say uh, first thing in the morning, hey, we're going from Calgary to Regina for a meeting. And then as they're sitting at the meeting, they go, oh, we need to, we decided to take one of our clients here along with us. Can we make a stop in Saskatoon before heading back to Calgary? And you're going, oh, yeah, we just got to do some rearranging here. So give us a minute. We'll reflight plan and recalculate this. Uh, you can't be someone that if you get that, that you go, oh, what do we do oh my god so and panic so you need someone to be able to adapt to the change and start making decisions so obviously a good decision making capability is what i have at the end um, especially at the airlines not so much when you're working in charter you end up working with the same people but more so if you end up at the airlines you have to be able to work with different personalities because i'm sure andrew can tell you you never really fly with the same person twice um, you'll always fly with someone different. It's the idea that you're an instant team. You might have never met this person before, but suddenly you got to be their best friend. It, uh, it's a weird dynamic. You got to be like, treat them like you've known this guy for years. You've only known him for two minutes. Yeah. And of course, with that becomes being an effective communicator. Uh, you'll also know that, and as you'll see in the industry, you're going to have to become a constant learner. And that's even with everything right now. As technology changes, you have to keep up with the technology. So as technology changes, so does that happen within the aircraft with avionics. So you're also going to be flight tested every year to keep your job. So you're continually learning something. You have to be able to think three dimensionally when you start learning how to fly, because you have to start thinking where you are, where you want to be and how you're going to get there. So that's another part that you'll you'll experience as your flight training. Um, you need some good hands and feet coordination. So I know just when I used to flight instruct, uh, gaming had just started and I noticed a lot of the, the guys that were big gamers were really good with their hands and feet. And then they also adapted, they would pretty much show me a lot of things because that was right when the glass panel was coming out and they'd be able to, with their little fingers, get in all the buttons and, and know how to work everything. So I'm sure if a lot of you are computer people and gamers, you're going to have a lot of fun learning to fly. Even programming, if you understand how basic programming, I'm not talking sophisticated, but a lot of the computers in some of these aircraft um, require a bit of uh, know-how to use them. And uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with, uh, like I said, basic programming, it'll make things easier. Yeah. And something that uh, Andrew touched on 
uh, when he mentioned about the economy and the downturn and of course 9-11 and now of course COVID. Uh, something if you are, because I've been through all of those and uh, what makes, what I've noticed, what makes pilots stay, you really have to have the love of aviation, but what you develop through that is resilience. Uh, so if you're someone that's uh, resilient to a lot of things, this, this is a great industry for you. Of course, positive attitude, that goes with anything. Um, but as I've mentioned, if you're going to work with different personalities and, uh, and, and team work capability, you have to have a positive attitude and be able to help within the decision making within the team. And actually, I'll add to that, that positive attitude as well. There's, there's a fine line between being everyone's friend and being a pushover. So the, the, one of the biggest things that's kind of been driven home to me over the years is that you're fair, firm, and friendly. Uh, sometimes in cockpits, uh, disagreements do take place and you need to resolve them diplomatically without compromising safety. And being able to do that uh, in a non-confrontational manner, but still making sure that you do not compromise your principles. Uh, is, is a strong skill to have. So don't be, a, we say the hardest thing in aviation is telling someone no. And uh, it takes skill to do that. Absolutely. And of course, I'm sure you've all been waiting for this is potential earnings. So I don't want to sugarcoat it. Um, it is getting slightly better now in the industry, uh, but it's, you spend a lot of money, but uh, to keep in mind when you first start out, you don't make a lot of money. So some, some companies are starting to do something better about that um, because obviously with the pilot shortage I think they, they realized they had to start looking at that so you can make anywhere from 20,000 a year to 300,000 a year now keep in mind the 300,000 a year you've obviously got some experience behind you and you've got some um, I guess you're higher up on the to totem pole per se at, at the company and then it also depends on the area of flying such as if you're flying in the bush charter instructing the airlines, firefighting, there's where the air potential earnings will, will differ. And I'll just add slightly to that there as well, that when it comes to the earnings, aviation is a huge field. There is a broad array of different departments and uh, specialties you can go into. Generally speaking, when it comes to the money side of things, you get paid by your ability to specialize. Uh, so the more specialized you are in any given trade, the better off you're going to be. But the problem is that does limit the amount of utility for your skill set. Uh, so making sure that you specialize in the areas that are going to be more sustainable than others is going to be important. So I made a comment in the, uh, in the chat window there saying that crop dusters, I mean, some guys who've only been doing this for 10 or 15 years are making above $200,000. Now, granted, they're running their own company at that point, but they started out from nothing and then here they are. So there, there can be a lot of money in that. When it comes to the airlines, uh, the pay is structured. So you're gonna get paid based on seniority. This is why I recommend if you are gonna go in the airlines that you do invest uh, your time getting in there as early as you can, if that's the direction you wanna go. Um, but yeah, like Audrey said, don't sugarcoat it. Uh, getting into the airline or getting into aviation in general, uh, you're gonna you're not getting in it for the money. Uh, you're you need to get in it because you have a love for it, a passion for it. You want to travel, you want to see the world, you want to have fun. Uh, this isn't going to make you rich. I mean, generally speaking, we say that the pay for pilots is like a hockey stick over time. So it starts off fairly low, and then at the end of your career, it kicks up at the end, and that's where you can make the money. So you're still going to be working until you're in your 60s potentially. Uh, the max of the maximum retirement age for pilots in the airlines is 65 so you must be retired at 65 uh, and make sure that you put enough in the piggy bank during that time to justify what lifestyle you want to sustain after that and uh, generally speaking we say that uh, make hay while the sun shines so put away money during the good times because you never know when the bad times might be just around the corner absolutely and i think we're coming close to time here so i'm just going to quickly uh, a day in the life of a pilot. Well, I can speak from being a flight instructor in corporate aviation. Uh, as a flight instructor, it's day to day uh, showing up, typically like a, like a school environment, showing up for your students, uh, developing lesson plans, um, yeah, have a little bit of classroom time. And then of course, into the airplane you go and it's basically Monkey see, monkey do. You show them what to do, then they imitate it, and then they're expected to practice that on their own. Uh, so that is day-to-day -day, um, life of a flight instructor. A corporate aviation, that was my favorite. Um, a day in the life, you show up an hour before the flight, and between you and the captain, 
you've got to do the flight planning, you've got to do a walk around, you've got to make sure your catering is there and on board, that the aircraft is stocked, depending on where you're going, that you've got extra stock for your return flight. Uh, you've got all the de details from your dispatch. And then of course, you're basically uh, a, a newspaper boy, girl, uh, you're the butler in the back, you're carrying uh, the, the luggage and loading up the aircraft and making sure that your client is taken care of at all times, you have high customer service skills. Um, and that's now being the general manager, I'm just overseeing the flight school, so I'm overseeing to make sure that all the instructors and the chief flying instructor and our admin person, all our ramp attendants, are all doing their jobs and making sure that the school runs uh, efficiently and safely and that is about all that i can say in the day in the life of pilot i know andrew has something more exciting because he's been to the airlines uh so i'll let him speak on that sure uh, i'll keep it fairly brief but yeah when you get to the airlines uh you, the way to think about it, you're a cog in the machine and that's a good thing because uh unlike uh with audrey if you're flying corporate it's a it's a one-man show for the or one person show for the lack of a better word where you, you're the front end line of defense and you basically do everything when you're at the airlines, you, you show up one hour before your flight, you get the flight plan from your flight, flight planning office, you brief it with your instructor or with your crew, basically. And that, that's not just, or sorry, not your instructor, you brief with your captain or your first officer. Uh, so you meet with your crew and that doesn't just mean uh, cockpit crew, ca um, flight deck crew, it means your cabin. So you, you brief with the flight attendants as well and you uh, talk to them about what the plans are for the day. And then you, uh, you go to the aircraft, you program things and uh, you know, it's fairly leisurely. That's what I'll say. The nice thing about being in the airlines is that if there's ever any issues, you can usually call someone up for help, whereas if you're flying corporate, uh, that's not really the case. Awesome. And I left this for questions, but I know Andrew's got some stuff to go over quickly. Um, I can stop sharing so that Andrew can yeah. there we go. Um, so I had a small presentation as well here, and I'm not going to go through it in the same amount of detail that Audrey did because it's covered uh, some really good points here. Um, can you guys see? Um, my, is it sharing my screen or is it sharing my, my PowerPoint here? Uh, we're seeing both right now, the screen plus also your side notes or your side. Okay, uh, let me see here. Share presentation. Zoom share. There we go. Um, so yeah, basically just for familiarity, this is what the flying club looks like. Uh, so just park in the parking lot, come through the front door and you guys can uh, come to us in the back basically. Just mind your way around the aircraft. If, if you see an aircraft with somebody in it and the engine's not running, don't get too close because uh, it could spark up at any time. Um, and basically just kind of want to talk a little more about, uh, actually I'll make it full screen here, about the, uh, the industry and the state of affairs right now because we are mid COVID. And this is probably the big point that everyone's gonna be wanting to, to know is that what is the outlook? And I'm of two minds about this. So. I kind of consider this an extinction level event when it comes to certain companies, but there's going to be a massive upswell of different kinds of companies. So what you need to do is you need to kind of turn your attention away from the dinosaurs and look for the mammals in this situation. Where, where are the opportunities going to lie? And I think as much as people are excited to get back traveling as soon as uh, things open up again, I expect that to be fairly short lived because I imagine that people's personal finances will be kind of curtailed as a result of this. So yeah, there's gonna be maybe for a six months to a year, things are gonna be pretty good with vacation destinations. Um, but I personally believe that's probably not going to be sustained. So I imagine that there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for regional flying in terms of uh, back and forth in Canada. I think cargo is going to continue to go strength to strength. So if you can get yourself early in a cargo company or even in a, a nimble operator that doesn't have a lot of overhead. The problem with the companies like WestJet and Air Canada is that they have they're a huge operation and they have a lot of moving pieces and a lot of debt and liabilities. So if they're ever in a situation where they can't pay those debts and liabilities, then there is a potential that they could go into receivership. Uh, and that did happen to Air Canada back in 2003 after 9-11. Now, eventually uh, they did work their way through that situation. And I've heard rumors that there could potentially be a bailout of the airlines uh, coming here in the next six months or so. But we'll wait and see what happens there. Personally, I think if you're starting off in the industry, Becoming an instructor is a fantastic opportunity because it gives you great hands and feet flying skills in terms of working on your fundamentals. Uh, you network, uh, you keep yourself flying, so you're building hours in the logbook. Uh, that's not to say there's another, uh, there's, there aren't other opportunities out there in terms of starting off. I did already mention that you can work ramp where you're basically the gopher at different companies. That's another opportunity. And usually that gives you the opportunity to bypass flying piston aircraft and get yourself right into the 
right seat of a two crew aircraft flying a turboprop. So that is a, an advantage to that, it's just delayed returns in terms of your investment. Uh, my instructor is great, I recommend it. I, I have a lot of fun doing it. It's probably one of my most um, enjoyable jobs that I've ever done, so, and that includes the airlines. The airlines are, they're fun, but they're a snore. I mean, you, you get to where you're going and you have fun there, but the getting A to B, you're just staring out the window. And if you got someone that you're flying with that you enjoy uh, hanging out with, that's one thing, but uh, it's, it's, it's a boring job. Um, but yeah, in terms of the industry, I think if you're starting off looking for smaller companies to, to get in on the ground floor with, uh, and then uh, investing your time with them, uh, is probably your best way to get ahead. So the time with a specific company is the, probably the best way to, to move, to accelerate your career. But uh, that's probably my best advice is saying that there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, but uh, where we end up in this might not be where you necessarily expected us to be. The biggest thing is to have fun in your adventure because where I thought I wanted to end up at, I didn't, but you know what? I still had fun in the meantime with all the other experiences. Mm -hmm. And make sure that when you're choosing a career, it's something that you have a passion and, and desire and love to do because it is going to be your job and you're going to spend a lot of time there. And if you don't enjoy what you're doing, um, it's going to turn into that J-O-B where you're just going there and dragging yourself in and it's not fun. So you got to make sure that whatever you choose to do, that you're having fun at it because then it won't feel like you're going to work every day. You're going to be having fun doing it. If, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Exactly. Any questions? Uh, yeah, we just wanted to maybe highlight a couple of things. Thank you so much for those. And we're going to call them words of wisdom because I think that's really important, especially for students that we know have interest in this sector. And it is, I mean, you can't help but turn on the TV and see kind of the doom and gloom right now of the of the whole flying and tourism industry, right? Um, I have a question about that whole NAV Canada, that elephant in the room with the, the flight towers and so forth. Um, how do you see that affecting the Regina Airport um, as a whole? Um, and maybe just going to a flight center, yeah. maybe explain to students what the difference would be as losing your tower as opposed to having a flight center um, kind of manage those, those flights that are coming into the city? Well, as for the airport, um, for experienced pilots, um, we are able to still work with flight services because at a minimum, that's what they would, would leave us with. And so they're able to uh, tell pilots uh, what the local traffic is in the area or what they're, who they're expecting. And then as pilots, you, you kind of put that in your head. And this is where I said uh, in the presentation to be able to think uh, three-dimensionally because uh, then you could start thinking in your head if this aircraft's coming in here, so then there's safety. So you're thinking of safety. But as for the Regina Flying Club, uh, with new students, uh, that is a safety concern for us because of the different kinds of aircraft that show up here. Because we've got military aircraft coming in from Moose Jaw to do some training. Uh, we've got the airlines coming in. Um, corporate jet aircraft still come in here. And then of course, then we have uh, our, us, the little people with the flight training. Um, so safety is going to be of a concern, but we are still being like, as we're training people, uh, that's how we'll help mitigate some of that safety. Um, the experience uh, will be different for students if we don't have a control tower, um, but it's nothing different than flying out of uncontrolled airports that are all over Saskatchewan. Um, it's just a different experience. But again, um, as you progress and then well, probably end up having to do cross countries to somewhere like Saskatoon where there'll be a controlled airport so that our students do have that ability to learn how to work from a control tower. But um, yeah, as the airport for a whole, um, it will be unfortunate to, to lose that if that's what they so choose after their study with NAV Canada, but it is something that will be managed and can be mitigated but we certainly do love having that service. Is there anything, Andrew, that you could add? Yeah, I would say it's a real, it's a nothing burger, to be honest. Um, I mean, there is, I mean, when I started off instructing, I worked at Fredericton and they had no tower. Uh, Fredericton didn't have a tower for about the first uh, 18 months that I was there. And we had 
a flight school that had 25 different aircraft on top of two King Airs and then Air Canada and uh, WestJet were coming in there as well. Even we had Air France actually flew in there too. Um, no, we, as long as you're familiar with it, and I think it really comes down to the abilities of the people in the tower. So just for the, the person watching to kind of break it down into what happens when a tower closes, what, what a tower offers for pilots is they give you clearances, they give you instructions and say, you shall do this, you shall do that. When the tower closes, there's still somebody there we're talking to, but they're saying, I recommend you do this. I suggest you do that. Uh, and they're not, they're not strictly controlling you, but they're still giving you advice. So I think at the end of the day, it comes down to the ability and the, uh, the skill of the people that are still up there, uh, giving good advice and good uh, recommendations. So as far as the safety things go, it is a little bit more responsibility that's placed on the pilots in order to be more vigilant with looking out and for, it's more of having a conversation than having a dictatorship really is a, a tower is basically you shall do this um and they're going to keep you safe they, they are the ones that take responsibility for your safety when their tower is closed and to be honest that's the nice thing to be aware of with regina is that the tower here is not 24 7. so i think after 10 or 11 o'clock at night and until six or seven in the morning there's no tower they just go home and so then we become an uncontrolled airport for lack of a better word so instead of having a, an eight hour window or so that we're uncontrolled, it just becomes a 24 hour window. So the operation is still gonna continue. Um, I don't think it's a huge deal. It does mean like, like Audrey says, we do have to make sure our students are more aware of the changes, but uh, as long as they're, they're well briefed and they kind of get comfortable with it, I, I don't think safety will be compromised. Thank you for clarifying that. And I think you actually answered my question too, because so that not having necessarily a control tower wouldn't, um, discourage your Air Canada's and your West Jets and maybe some of your transit or whatever no. sun destinations from coming into the city? The biggest, if there's uh, money to be made, they will come here. That's the, the way to think about it. If they can fill up the seats and they can justify putting a, a full bus of uh, people on the plane, uh, they're going to come here regardless. Air Canada does has no concerns of flying to uncontrolled airports. I mean, uh, I've flown to Sault Ste. Marie, I've flown to Prince George, I've flown to Whitehorse. Those are all uncontrolled airports, and I did that in the regional jet. So uh, it just means a little more res responsibility on the flight crew, but they're fully trained for that, and it's not going to slow them down. Awesome. That is very good news because, uh, I, yeah, because you, 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 you're never quite sure how the media project, you know, projects that, too, and, and what the yeah. long term. So I think we have to have some more questions from yeah. here. Uh, I was just wondering if, if you got into this, what, what's the cost of a rental of an aircraft? And I know that's a general term because it depends which aircraft, but uh, fuel, uh, licensing fees, landing and taking off, all of that kind of stuff must have a fee attached to it, right? So what do those look like if, if people were getting a license, but then wanted to, let's say, take their family somewhere? Or well, as we listed the prices in the presentation, so you're looking at roughly um, $177 an hour for our Cessna 172. So if that if you were a licensed pilot and wanted to take up your family, uh, that is what you would pay an hour for one of our aircraft. Um, if you go on a long cross country and, and need the plane longer for a few days, of course, we have to go through an authorization process, make sure you're all checked out on the aircraft. Um, when you purchase fuel, away because our fuel is included in our rental price uh, then whatever you purchase for fuel uh, you'll get uh, refunded back on the return with your when we final your your aircraft rental bill other than that you anywhere else other than regina because we don't have landing fees here if you pay for landing fees or storage anywhere else the onus is on you to take care of that um, one other thing i just wanted to know a uh, favorite flying story or maybe scariest story I don't know maybe they're the same thing I'm not quite sure well I have a um, an emergency experience that I had I was with a student and he was getting it was getting close to solo time for him and I was instructing out of Edmonton City Center Airport which is right in the middle of Edmonton and on takeoff, it was a rather breezy day that day. We we're taking off into the wind, of course. And at city center, um, like I mentioned, it's right in the middle of the city. So it's a bustling city. And we took off and on takeoff, uh, we lost engine power. The, the prop was still going. We still had a little bit of power there, but nothing was being generated. And I looked at my student because I was like, is this for real? And I'm like, you got full power, right? And he's like, yep. 
and I'm like looking around and we were only at about 400 feet off the ground uh, when that happened and I started to look around and all I could see straight ahead of me was ball diamonds which also had the instrument landing system in that field straight ahead so there's wires there was also a busy street there that still had the electrical buses that have the electrical wires for the buses and i'm going well if i land straight ahead those are that's not a good option there's a good chance that we'll hit something there so i started to look around me and going turning around is the only option and as a pilot you're told that 500 feet below you should be pretty much landing straight ahead if you're higher than that, there's the option of turning around. But when I looked straight ahead, that was not an option. And luckily, because of how windy it was, and we were able, as I was looking around to make that decision, um, climbed another 100 feet. And then I was like, well, turning around is what I'm going to have to do. So I ended up taking control of the aircraft. For the first time in my life, I had to make a mayday call. Uh, that was the most eerie thing on the radio because the radio got quiet. And then after I made the call, no one spoke. And then the control tower came back telling me that I was cleared to land wherever I needed to. And then they ended up, there was a, an air ambulance coming in and they ended up holding them until I landed for them to get a clearance to land. But as I made that turn back to the field, all that wind that was enabling me to climb now was pushing me down the field. And so I had, uh, to get down and land in a short period or a short area now compared to when we took off. So do as I say, not as I do. I ended up putting on full flaps. I ended up slipping and that's just another way to make the aircraft come down because uh, I also had to lose the airspeed that I was picking up by doing that in order to safely land on the remainder of the runway and not hit the crash fence now that was at the end of the runway, which was now the Yellowhead Highway, which was bustling at noon. And I got the aircraft down, laid on the brakes, laid a patch of rubber onto the runway. And then uh, because it was further down on the runway, went off onto the grass a little bit. And I think I landed about 30 feet short from the crash fence. And it was also spring and we hadn't had any rain yet, so it was fairly dry. And for some reason, the firemen were driving along the field, I don't know, for a drive around the field, and kind of had wondered why we had turned around and why we were off on the grass. And luckily they did come to check things out because uh, when I landed and stopped and my student and I were sitting there, uh, as we shut everything down and went to get out of the aircraft, as I opened up my door, the grass was so dry that I ended up starting a grass fire. So I had to pull out the fire extinguisher and put out the grass fire. And then luckily the firemen showed up so they doused the grass so that it wouldn't restart. So that was an experience. That's, That's a hell of a story. Wow. So it also showed that everything that you're trained and ingrained when something happens, you just start doing things that you you have learned yeah there's a saying you don't rise to the case you fail to your training andrew has the most amazing sayings <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, uh, and that's a great story and the one thing that's um most uh challenging about that is you're in a single engine aircraft and the one thing to say about when you're flying any kind of a multi-engine aircraft, if you lose an engine, it's unfortunate, but you'll still be able to get yourself out. But when you're flying a single engine, you really, you really hang your hat on having that engine uh, operate correctly. And there's an old joke in aviation that goes, uh, if you want to see a pilot sweat, turn off the fan. That's what means <laughs> the propeller. So yeah, that's, uh, you, you really have to fall back to your stick and rudder skills and to, to get yourself down safely. So um, that's, a, that's a cool story. I'm glad you got down uh, all right there. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, so that. That. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I was just going to say thank you so much for sharing that story with us. It, it just puts into perspective the things that you're dealing with literally, you know, anytime you, you um, manage or, or get up in an airplane too. So 
Awesome. And I do. It's I think nothing to be afraid of. Like I'll say that with flying, um, the more you do something, the more confident you get with it because losing an engine is unfortunate, but you become a glider at that point. As long as you've been training your gliding techniques, you'll be totally fine. So don't get the impression that this is a dangerous practice. It's, it's no more dangerous than those old statistics saying that you're more likely to get hurt driving to the airport than you are in a plane. Uh, and that's very true. This is a very safe practice, but uh, you still have to be diligent. You have to be professional about it. Um, and even with taking the best uh, steps to ensure your safety, things can still go wrong. Emergencies are kind of a necessary thing in aviation, and you can't just pull over on the side of the road when you're flying and, and ask for help. So you have to pretty much rely on yourself to troubleshoot the problem and get yourself down safely. And like I said, sticking to your training and the quality of the training that you've received really does make a difference and impact your, your skill as a pilot. And this is the great thing, I'll kind of wrap things up by saying the great thing about the Regina Flying Club is that we've got some fantastic instructors here, a lot of experience. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a wealth of knowledge to be gained from talking to some of these guys here. Okay. Well, again, thanks again to Audrey and Andrew for this informative presentation to help students in their quest to make a better choice about their future employment opportunities. So thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. That was awesome. Thank My you. Pleasure.